So in the XOR problem, we had the issue that a linear separator isn't going to be able to separate, well, some very, very simple data. Now, <clears throat> the obvious solution in hindsight is to go to more than one layer. And mind you, the brain does the same thing. So there's this pretty picture of the brain and its connectivity structure. Okay, so what does this all have to do with XOR? So let's just look at those two classifiers. So one that just you know, splits horizontally, one that splits vertically. Right. Neither of those actually helps, but you know, I could easily implement each of them as a linear classifier. So I have you know, the blue one and the orange one, and they you know, split you know, data points one, two, three, four, according to those plus and minus signs. But now the really cool thing is that if I take the product of those two classifiers, I get a solution to the XOR problem, which is utterly unsurprising given that I can actually write the XOR as multiplications in this way. So, you know, this should, sur this should surprise absolutely nobody, but logically it's quite neat because this is really just a deep network with a hidden layer, right? So I'm taking first output, the second output, multiplying it together in the next layer, and I'm done. Okay, so that looks nice. Let's see whether we can do more. So here's a single hidden layer. And if I have a classification problem for the output, well, here's the output. And I'm going to call the output O and the hidden layer H. Now, in this case, I mean, I have some degree of freedom besides choosing which parameters to pick. I can choose how many hidden units I have. If I take a lot of them, I can possibly model a more complex function class. If I pick very few of them, I can't do so much. And there's a very nice fundamental work which says I can pretty much approximate any interesting function by just adding enough hidden units. The problem is, this is a beautiful general theoretical result that's utterly useless in practice. Because nobody would ever do this because this would give you a very unpleasant, uh, not easy to work with function class. But at least you know you could do it if you really wanted to. So here's the math. We have some input x. We have some output, you know, we have hidden for the hidden layer, so we have, you know, some parameters w1 and bias1. For the output, we have, you know, some vector w2 and bias w2, so that's the scalar. And so for the hidden layer, I have some nonlinearity of w1 times x plus b1. And then for the output, I have w2 transposed h plus b2. And the sigma is an activation function. So, why do I need an activation function? Any ideas? So, yeah. Yes? Otherwise, it's just linear. Like, if you don't have an activation function, um, no matter how many layers you add on, it's equal to a sigma. Exactly. So, otherwise, I end up with a linear function after all because I can just apply one after the other and one matrix multiplied by the next one, it's never gonna be nonlinear. Actually, I can make matters worse by adding more layers. Okay. Why could I make things worse? Why is it a terrible idea? Overfitting? Not really because, I mean, ultimately it's just a linear function except that you have a really weird param parameterization, but you're onto something. Um, some other suggestions? Yes? Um, trace of dimensionality? No, that's the same thing as overfitting. That's not really gonna help us, but some very practical issues. So, <clears throat> exactly, so there, there, there are two things. The first thing is, 
it might take forever to converge because I have a very large set of equivalent networks. And so I may not converge very well and it'll just, you know, run around in that space. The second thing, and that's a more mathematically problematic one, is I may actually have a less expressive network that way. Right. So let's say I have, you know, 10-dimensional input, a 10-dimensional output, and in the middle I have a, you know, maybe five hidden units. Then I automatically force my entire network to be just of dimensionality five in terms of, you know, basically the rank of that matrix, and that considerably restricts what I can do. So not only do I lose expressiveness, I can actually make things worse than a simple linear model. So that's why we need an activation. So here's some activation functions. It's one of the simpler ones. It's one plus one over one plus e to the minus x. And this used to be a very popular activation function a long time ago. Essentially, nobody uses this one now anymore. Does anybody have an idea of why this is actually a really bad idea? So Jan Lekar even used to have a stop sign with the sigmoid in it and a crossed through. So why is it a bad idea? Yes? Um, with really large inputs, the gradient goes to zero. Exactly. So for very negative inputs and for very positive inputs, the gradient goes to zero. And there's this tiny Goldilocks zone somewhere between maybe minus two and two where interesting things happen. And if by some bad luck, your input scale got out of range, such that you ended up in either one of those two flat regions, then your optimization algorithm would essentially get stuck. Because you wouldn't get any meaningful gradients anymore. Everything vanishes, and it just for, it takes forever to converge. So there's another one. It's a tang. And that one's just as bad, because it's just the same thing as before, just with different scales. Right. So you can actually show that these two functions are equivalent after some rescaling. Okay. Now what does everybody use now? Everybody uses this thing called ReLU, rectified linear unit. But ReLU sounds so much fancier, it's just the max of x and zero, right? So if you talk ReLU, then everybody goes like, oh, you know, deep learning arc, uh, <laughs> jargon, <laughs> right? So. That's why, you know, remember that you can impress people. Now, um, now this actually doesn't have this problem quite so much anymore. So at least it only has half that problem. So there's, there's a half space where your gradient will not vanish. Actually, the, for that half space, your gradient will be just one. For the other half space, it's still zero, but okay, it's at least a lot better. So given that, at some point, some people came up with an idea, well, let's fix that problem on the left-hand side and use something called a prelu. And the prelu is essentially the relu, but just where the constant zero is then shifted a little bit below or above. And that really then is also learnable to some extent. So in other words, rather than this function here, you use maybe that. Then you have some coefficient alpha and you can learn it. Um, in some cases, it makes things a little bit better. So don't bother unless you really know you have this problem. Okay. So these are all the activation functions. Okay. So now we can do multi-class classification. And the only thing we need to do for that is, you know, we have, you know, input layer, hidden layer, output layer. Right, and then I run a softmax on top of that. So in terms of math, <coughs> well, we have hidden layer is sigma of w1 times x plus b. The output is w2 times h plus b. And then y is softmax of o. And yeah, I should have bold-faced o here. Um, so then, 
because we like this so much, well, we can have more layers, right? And if you use OmniGraffle, that's easy, but at some point it gets really hard to specify that way. So this is where specifying networks in code is going to be a lot easier. Now, once you have that, you have a lot more freedom of design for your design parameters, right? You can add more layers, you can make it deeper, you can add more hidden units, and depending on how you do this, so for instance, you could make a network that's just straight up and then just you know goes to two outputs, or that's narrow in the middle and it gets wider again. And this is really something where you may want to tune things a little bit for the specific data set at hand. Okay. And so that is all about multilayer perceptrons. And now we'll have just enough time to actually try this out in practice. So, any questions so far on the theory? Okay, no questions? Good, awesome.